In this video, we're going to be looking at the next major section of the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at the Latter Prophets. What the editors of the Hebrew Bible called the Latter Prophets are what we're more familiar with as uh, prophetic literature. Although there's, uh, here again, there's a little bit, a uh, little bit change of change in the ordering. The, uh, what we call the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and we'll notice that we're leaving out Lamentations and Daniel. Those two books are in the writing section. And following Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, we have the Book of the Twelve, or these are the ones that we call the Minor Prophets. For about um, 150 years or so, the um, dominant position in scholarship was that um, Isaiah should be broken into three parts. The first 39 chapters dealing with a 8th century BCE context. The uh, chapters 40 through 55 dealing with a 6th century BCE context, moving in the transition between the Babylonian and the Persian periods, and chapters 56 to 66 dealing with a later Persian uh, context, uh, moving uh, in the directions of apocalyptic literature. Uh, apocalyptic literature ultimately uh, finds its greatest expression in the book of Daniel, which uh, we will discuss in another video. Uh, more recent scholarship, however, has tended uh, to move back in the direction of seeing Isaiah as a unity, because after all, it is uh, a unity, or it is one book in, uh, in our Bibles, although it has a, a very large uh, range. And uh, Isaiah himself, the, uh, the uh, prophet named Isaiah, uh, lived in the 8th century, and uh, he had uh, significant involvement with uh, a couple of the kings, in particular uh, King Ahaz, King Hezekiah, and King Uzziah. And uh, in fact, in chapter 6, he says that his prophetic call came in the very year that King Uzziah died. Uh, this is uh, seeing Isaiah as a unity is probably a better way of looking at it because uh, uh, we're dealing with the final form of the text, but um, uh, uh, nevertheless, where, whether uh, somebody, somebody brought it together in a late date or Isaiah was able to, uh, in the 8th century, was able to foresee on all these events, uh, uh, either, either way, uh, God is involved in the, in the process, and that's, that's the most important thing that... Uh, that uh, we'll uh, notice as we read the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, as we've considered in an earlier uh, video, also has one of the uh, most famous uh, messianic uh, predictions, uh, messianic texts in the Old Testament. This, uh, this idea that the virgin shall be with child and will uh, give birth to uh, a baby, and which will be called Emmanuel, which, sit, which means God is with us. And uh, the Gospel writer Matthew uh, picked up on, the, on this idea to talk about uh, the very important baby that he was concerned with, the, uh, uh, the baby Jesus. Uh, but uh, Isaiah has a very uh, wide range and uh, also looks to... Uh, looks to key moments of deliverance in Israel's history. Not just the, uh, the deliverance from, from the Assyrians where that the prophecy in, in chapter 7 is uh, immediately concerned with, but also he looks for the, the deliverance from the um, Babylonians that uh, uh, chapters 40 to 55 uh, look toward. And uh, one of the key elements there is uh, Isaiah is uh, Isaiah has a lot of material related to uh, the Persian king Cyrus, who was the 
great liberator, the one who uh, uh, allowed the, the people to go back to the, the homeland that they had been exiled from and uh, allowed them to, to rebuild the temple with, uh, with the imperial funds. Isaiah may, even makes the bold claim that Cyrus is God's Messiah. He uses the term Messiah, referring to this non-Israelite king. So that's a that's an inter- interesting um, interesting bit of thing that um, Isaiah says there. The book of Second Chronicles uh, comes along uh, a bit later and uh, and says that Cyrus was stirred up by the spirit of the Lord to uh, to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem in order to fulfill the word of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, so the chroniclers associate this prophecy about Cyrus with Jeremiah, even though it's, it's ultimately preserved for us in the book of Isaiah. The book of uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah is uh, one of the prophets who experienced the fall of Jerusalem at first hand. He is a prophet who was called, according to chapter 1, even before he was born, God had set him out and commissioned him to be a prophet to uh, the nations. Uh, Jeremiah is, is preaching at a time when things are looking very bleak for the nation of Judah. Uh, the, the sin is mounting and mounting and mounting up, and uh, there's a, a time at which Jeremiah says that even now, even now, even after all this sin, you can still turn God's judgment away if you would, uh, if you would only repent. Jeremiah gives a, a famous sermon at the gates of the temple uh, where he says, If you truly amend your ways and your doings, uh, speaking for God, I will come and allow you to live in this place. I will be your God and you will be my people. But do not trust in the deceptive idea that because the temple of the Lord is here, God will not allow Jerusalem to be destroyed. Do not, essentially, he says, do not take the temple of the Lord as an idol. Jeremiah, in particular, is very concerned about idolatry, concerned about uh, not worshiping God with an undivided heart. One of the uh, key ideas for the worship of the Lord in, in the prophets, and particularly in the, uh, these prophets that are around the time of the Babylonian exile, is that uh, God alone, the Lord alone should be worshipped. The worship of the Lord should not be uh, mixed in with the worship of any other gods. And Isaiah even makes the bold claim on, uh, around this time that there is indeed no other God throughout all of the world. Uh, prior, prior to this time, there, uh, there was this idea that uh, Israel had its God, and Moab had its God, and Edom had its God, and Babylonian had, Babylon had its God, and Egypt had many gods and goddesses, and all of these things. But it was the prophets of the exile, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel in particular, that make the bold claim, make the strong claim, that there is only one God over all of the kingdoms of the earth. And uh, Jeremiah extends this claim in chapter 18 when uh, he goes to uh, visit the potter's house. And uh, God says that if there's, any, if there's ever a nation that I planned either good things or bad things for, if If I planned good things for a nation and they turn away from me and act wickedly, then I will change my good plans for them and I will allow them to be destroyed. But if there's a nation that I had promised destruction for and they turn in faithfulness to me, I will turn away the punishment that I had planned for them. So there's some some interesting claims being, uh, being made here that God is ultimately in control of all of the events of world history. And 
Uh, also with Jeremiah, we need to uh, consider how the very different textual traditions that we have in the Septuagint and in the Masoretic text or the Hebrew uh, text. The uh, Greek text is, uh, is about one-eighth shorter than the Masoretic text, and uh, there's a, some different ordering of the, of the material. And um, we, we've talked about the Septuagint before in previous videos, but um, one thing that's very, very interesting is when the Dead Sea Scrolls started to be translated and examined in the uh, middle part of the 20th century, it was discovered that within the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were textual traditions. There, were, there was a text of Jeremiah that followed the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, and there was also a text, portions of Jeremiah that followed the Greek Septuagint text. So that made this, this divergence in the textual tradition of Jeremiah, this, this made it a thousand years older, older than we had previously uh, envisioned. Uh, Jeremiah is uh, uh, some, somewhat of a, of a depressed uh, prophet, but uh, nevertheless, he ultimately says that uh, the word of the Lord is a, is a fire burning up in his bones, and he cannot shut it off. He cannot refuse to speak in the name of the Lord lest the fire that is within him consume his entire soul. The book of Ezekiel uh, is the third of the uh, major prophets. And uh, Ezekiel was a bit of a um, bit of younger contemporary than uh, Jeremiah. Uh, he is of a priestly family, uh, like, like Jeremiah was. Jeremiah was of the priests in a town called Anathoth. But Ezekiel uh, lives with the exiles in Babylon near the, uh, uh, near the Kebar uh, River. And he has, he has wonderful heavenly visions of, of uh, beasts and faces and, and spinning, spinning wheels and all these, uh, all these very strange and wonderful things. And uh, Ezekiel hears about the, the final fall of Jerusalem while he is, in, uh, he is in exile. But then Ezekiel uh, moves toward looking to see what is, what is going to happen next after the exile. Because both Jeremiah and Ezekiel are convinced that the punishment that God brings is not just to destroy the people of God, but is it is to to purge the people of God from the of the things that um, the elements in their in their worship in their thinking in their action that that offended God uh, to to cleanse them of what had been offensive. Uh, Ezekiel says in chapter thirty six that uh, 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 he will take away the people's heart of stone and will give them a heart of flesh. He will sprinkle them with clean water and uh, the people will be clean. The people will be empowered to, to live a new life of faithfulness to God, even after the great uh, punishment of the exile. One of the, uh, perhaps the most famous uh, text from the book of Ezekiel is the Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, Ezekiel is taken out into a valley, and there's all kinds of bones all over the valley. And God says, Son of man or, or mortal, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel says, Well, Lord, only you know this. So uh, God commands Ezekiel to preach to the bones. Ezekiel preaches to the bones, and they all come together, but they're lying on the ground as if they're dead. And then God tells Ezekiel to preach to the wind, preach to the breath, and say to the breath, enter these dry bones that they may live. Ezekiel preaches to the wind, the uh, wind enters these, uh, these dead bodies and they stand up on their feet, a very, very vast army. And God says, 
that these dry bones are like the children of Israel. They say, all of our hope is cut off. We are completely ruined. There is no hope for us at all. But yet, there is still hope. Jeremiah had said that you will live in Babylon for a very long time, but yet I have plans for you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to destroy you. And Ezekiel says, you are not completely cut off. There is still a future for the people of God. You will be empowered to live faithfulness, live a life of faithfulness to God, even after all of these terrible things have happened to you. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are called the major prophets because their uh, prophetic books are very long, but they have a, um, a long-range vision even into the, perhaps in, even into the distant future of what God has promised for the people who are faithful to Him.